The Morrises are experts in non-lethal weapons technology. They are consultants to the Defense Department, CIA, NSA, and world-renowned think tanks. The technology necessary to project three-dimensional images to a point in space requires no new breakthroughs in science. We have the technology now. Overall, uh, the non-lethal weapons development program is aimed at giving our military options between talking and shooting. A specific system development we really can't talk about. But the Morrises did talk in general about secret military experiments with lifelike 3D projections in the sky called holograms. Holograms on a battlefield would be to divert the attention of the enemy to deliver propaganda or something very frightening to make the enemy run away if you think that he will believe that what you are sending is really an angel, um, a devil, a UFO. Could this type of weaponry be tested? Perhaps not coincidentally, along the U.S.-Mexico border at the Army's electronic proving ground in Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Keep in mind that test facilities like Fort Huachuca in Arizona are electrical optical test beds and part of what they're testing are the effects of these electro-optical devices on a target population. And the target population may be us. America has to test American equipment in America. The ultimate weapon in the info war would be so secret, so invisible, so undetectable, you would never know your mind was under attack. At Laurentian University in Ontario, Canada, a young student is about to undergo one of the strangest experiences of her life. They're hooking Denise's brain up to an electroencephalograph, or EEG machine. For 30 to 40 minutes, this will monitor her brain waves. While these electric coils attached on either side of her head will immerse her brain in an electromagnetic field. Her brain actually completes the circuit between the two coils. The field pulsing through her brain is less powerful than one given off by a digital clock radio. But acutely controlled and focused at specific parts of the brain, it will open Denise's mind to outside suggestion by this man. Can do a switch and see uh, if it's right left hemisphere? Use your front okay. Dr. Michael Persinger is a professor of psychology and neuroscience. He is designing ways to put the power of mind control to good use. Dr. Persinger's research focuses on brain trauma. And he uses carefully controlled doses of electromagnetic radiation to induce relaxation and alleviate pain. So uh, what Sandra did was to initiate a opiate releasing pattern that's a burst firing field that um, is stimulated once every four seconds. And that produces relaxation and a very pleasant sensation. Uh, similarly, using the appropriate field, we can induce fear and apprehension, but clearly that would be unethical in that setting. Dr. Persinger's tests suggest that carefully programmed electromagnetic frequencies can tap into individual brains and influence people's emotions. The cognitive processes of the human brain are really quite simple. And if you understand how they work, you can make entire populations think and decide uh, the manner in which you wish. Many experts are skeptical of such an Orwellian scenario, but Persinger thinks the implications are chillingly real. Suppose you generate a field that produces fear, fundamental fear, in large numbers of people. And then, over the television, more traditional way, as you say, the reason we're having this fear is because of this particular group. And now you start to move the population believing in a direction that you wish. 
to influence 250 million people, the equivalent of the entire population of the United States, may not be that difficult. According to Dr. Persinger, you already have the technology, satellites and television, and radio transmitters. Mind control may already be happening. We know the mysterious PSYOPs plane can beam persuasive sounds and pictures into people's television sets. Will it someday beam disturbing frequencies directly into the mind? Mind control will be the ultimate non-lethal weapon. Uh, most people kind of in the back of their mind know there's something going on, but uh, it doesn't have anything to do with football or basketball or my paying my rent, so I don't want to fool with it. It's not mm -hmm. important. Yeah, but everybody kind of feels there's something going on. Yeah, because most people live in a box, mm -hmm. and they don't want to <coughs> find the box. No they, doubt about it. They open the lid every so now and again and just peep outside and they close it. Yep. Do you think the governments are going to let us know? Some point. I think, yeah, I'll tell you what, it's, again, it's just my opinion. Uh, Norio Hayakawa. Norio Hayakawa is a very good friend of mine. He's rather famous in the speaking circuit. And he's always talking about how he believes that the uh, government is going to uh, uh, stage some kind of a UFO landing and it's going to frighten everybody and all the nations will come together and collectively come together as a trick. Like a war of the worlds. Yeah, like a war of the worlds. Right. It's all going to be a trick, he thinks. Right. It's all going to be planned. And I thought, well, wait a minute. If you're going to get the, there's a lot of intelligent people in this world, and governments are not stupid. So if they're going, if you're going to pull off something like that, it better look good. Mm -hmm. Because it's going to be absolutely right. It better look good and very absolutely. realistic. I have then said I don't. I can look at the same facts that he's stating and come up with a different a conclusion. I'm of the opinion that very well possibly there's going to be an alien invasion mm -hmm. and the government knows it right and consequently they are trying to prepare the people so that they don't react uh, because that was as far as I'm concerned that was a CIA operation when Orison Wells back in the late 30s 38 39 did that war of the worlds thing mm -hmm. on radio mm -hmm. I'm sure the CIA was involved in that mm -hmm. And they wanted to see how the people will react if you, if the people really thought that there was an alien invasion from another world. Mm. It was called uh, War of the Worlds right. with uh, Orison Welles, and people went berserk. Well, I don't think they're going to go berserk today. Mm -hmm. I think too many people in this world have already had experiences. They know something's up. But I, again, I would say I'm thinking that there very well might be a legitimate invasion mm. soon. Project Blue Beam is a top secret operation of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, also known as NASA, of the United States of America. The goal of Project Blue Beam is to implement a new age religion, with the Antichrist at its head, and to create a new world order, via a technologically simulated second coming of a new messiah. The allegations were presented in 1994 by Quebecois journalist and conspiracy theorist Serge Manast, and later published in his book Project Blue Beam, NASA. In the 1970s and 1980s, Manast was a journalist, poet, and essayist. He was an active member of the Social Credit Party of Canada.
In the early 1990s, he started writing on the theme of the New World Order, and conspiracies hatched by secret societies, being particularly inspired by the works of William Guy Carr. Monast founded the International Free Press Agency, where he published most of his work on these themes, achieving some prominence with an interview on esotericist, and ufologist Richard Glenn's TV show, Esoterism Experimental, in which he repeatedly warned his audience about the dangers of a world government. He was interviewed by Glenn a number of times up to 1996. In 1994, he published Project Blue Beam, NASA, in which he detailed his claim that NASA, with the help of the United Nations, was attempting to implement a New Age religion, with the Antichrist at its head, and start a new world order, via a technologically simulated second coming of Christ. He also gave talks on this topic. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. After 1989, President Bush kept said, and it was a phrase that I often used myself, that we needed a new world order. During the during the conflict with Saddam Hussein, which he handled so superbly in in a short term sense, we kept talking about a new world order. Uh, and 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 then President Bush, at the end of that of that war, promised he would give four graduation addresses, four commencement addresses describing that new world order and what America's role was going to be in it. Turned out he gave one of those addresses and canceled the other three and talked about something else. That's what, because they weren't ready yet. That in fact we're all going to have to give up a little bit of our sovereignty in order to make the world work. And this present window of opportunity during which a truly peaceful and interdependent world order might be built will not be here for open for too long. Already there are powerful forces at work that threaten to destroy all of our hopes and efforts to erect an enduring structure of global cooperation. Are you optimistic a global system can happen it, from what it, we've heard so far? It, it, it could happen and in fact is in the world. By 1995 and 1996, Minast said he was being hunted by the police and authorities for involvement in networks of prohibited information. He had homeschooled his two children, who were then taken away, and made wards of the state in September 1996 so that they would receive a public education. Serge Monast died of a heart attack in his home in December 1996, at the age of 51, the day after being arrested, and spending a night in jail. His followers claim his death was suspicious, suggesting he was assassinated by psychotronic weapons to keep from continuing his investigations. Ladies and gentlemen, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society, and we are as a people inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security 
will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. No president should fear public scrutiny of his program, for from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people, for I have complete confidence and the response and dedication of our citizens whenever they are fully informed. I not only could not stifle controversy among your readers, I welcome it. This administration intends to be candid about its errors, for as a wise man once said, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. We intend to accept full responsibility for our errors, and we expect you to point them out when we miss them. Without debate, Without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Sola decreed it a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. And that is why our press was protected by the First Amendment, the only business in America specifically protected by the Constitution, not primarily to amuse and entertain, not to emphasize the trivial and the sentimental, not to simply give the public what it wants, but to inform, to arouse, to reflect, to state our dangers and our opportunities, to indicate our crises and our choices, to lead, mold, educate, and sometimes even anger public opinion. This means greater coverage and analysis of international news, for it is no longer far away and foreign, but close at hand and local. It means greater attention to improved understanding of the news, as well as improved transmission. And it means, finally, that government at all levels must meet its obligation to provide you with the fullest possible information outside the narrowest limits of national security. And so it is to the printing press to the recorder of man's deeds, the keeper of his conscience, the courier of his news, that we look for strength and assistance, confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent. The Project Blue Beam operation has four different steps in order to implement the New Age religion, with the Antichrist at its head. The New Age religion is the very foundation for the New World Government. Without a universal belief in the New Age religion, the success of the New World Order will be impossible to implement. We all worship the same God, Christian and Muslim. I think we do. It does. We have different routes of getting to the Almighty. 
do Christians and non-Christians, do Muslims go to heaven in your mind? Yes, they do. We have different routes of getting there. I think everybody that loves Christ or knows Christ, whether they're conscious of it or not, they're members of the body of Christ. And that's what God is doing today. He's calling people out of the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Christian world or the non-believing world. They are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but uh, they know in their heart that they need something that they don't have, and they turn to the only light that they have, and I think that they are saved and that they're going to be with us in heaven. Until I die, I'll proclaim nothing but love for all my brothers and sisters in Christ, my Catholic brothers and sisters, Protestant brothers and sisters, Christian reformers, Lutherans, I don't care what label you are. And you know, Jack, there are so many other Protestant ministers who are doing the same yes. thing as you. Yes. You're comfortable with the Vatican? Oh, I'm very comfortable with the Vatican. I've been to see the Pope several times. They believe in Christ. They believe in the death of Christ on the cross and his resurrection. I feel that I belong to all the churches. I'm equally at home in an Anglican or a Baptist church or a Brethren Assembly or a Roman Catholic church. You know what, we don't all have the same views and I realize Mormonism is not traditional Christianity, but I'm probably a little broader and more open in the fact that when somebody loves Jesus and believes they're the Son of God, that's good for me. Robert McGinnis with the Family Research Council says it appears the hidden agenda is to unite people under one religious organization so they will peacefully accept UN goals such as population control, abortion rights, and one world government. The Blue Beam Project will pretend to be the universal fulfillment of the prophecies of old, as major an event as that which took place 2000 years ago. This one God will in fact function as the Antichrist, who will explain that the various scriptures have been misunderstood, that the religious of old are responsible for turning brother against brother, nation against nation, that the religions of the world must be abolished to make way for the golden age, new age, of the one world religion, representing the one God they see before them. Naturally, this superbly staged, full-scale production will result in social, and religious disorder on a massive scale. Well, archaeologists in southern Israel making a major discovery, shedding new light on biblical history, uncovering a 3,000-year-old metropolis, once inhabited by the Philistines. Well, the Hebrew Bible's ultimate bad guys, one of the city's most famous residents, Goliath, you know, the warrior defeated by a young King David. Joining me now on the phone, the archaeologist in charge of the dig, Aaron Mayer, uh, joins me now. What an exciting find uh, for you, and I understand that you led this dig, uh, one of the many archaeologists that have uh, apparently excavated some pretty compelling evidence. Uh, what did you find this week in the city of Gath? Well, first of all, good evening, uh, Julie, or in Israel, it's good evening, over there, it's uh, good afternoon. Uh, we've been excavating at this site for um, more than uh, 15 years, and we just started our, our 15th season, and we have about 100 and something people from all over the world, and we found uh, a lot of evidence of a very thriving and interesting culture, and um, when you read the biblical text and you sort of get the, uh, the picture of the Philistines being the, the ultimate enemy of the Israelites, you sort of get an impression that they're just a barbarian culture, and in fact, um, they're very much of a sophisticated culture. Um, and I would say even that, at certain times, they're even more sophisticated than the Israelites. 
It's interesting, I, you know, on the Happening Now homepage, we posted a quiz question. Uh, who were the Bible's bad guys, as we're calling them today? The Greeks, the Philistines, the Koreans, the Huns, the Jordanians. As we now know, the answer is the Philistines. And you were talking about shedding some light on the culture of the Philistines, who are the, of course, arch enemies of the Israelites. What is it about what you found that, that proves or disproves that theory? Well, um, I think, first of all, we know a lot about the Philistines from the biblical text, mm -hmm. but that, of course, is a text that um, you know has its own agendas. You know, it's it's a it's a religious ideological text written by the Israelites, so they clearly would view their enemies in a very specific, uh, uh, subjective manner. So, what we can provide here is to have a view of daily life of the Philistines and sort of understand what's behind the the, the descriptions of the of the Philistines in the biblical text. So, for example. Uh, the biblical text um, alludes to the fact that they come from uh, somewhere outside the region. And we can show very clearly that the, the Philistines, in fact, arrived from somewhere near ancient Greece. Um, we hear of Philistines with names that are non-Semitic, such as Goliath, such as Achish, and others. We can show this uh, based on the archaeological evidence. And we can even show very simple things of daily life, substantial differences between the Philistines and the Israelites, which probably in ancient times really defined these two cultures. Just like today, we very often define the differences between ethnic groups based on right. how they, what they wear, what they eat. So, for example, the Philistines ate pig and dog meat. The Israelites wouldn't touch that. So this is probably things that were very substantial. And when you look at stories of, like, Samson fighting against the Philistines, but he didn't only right. fight against them. He also married a couple of them. So very cool, there's a so. very intricate relationship between the Philistines and the Israelites. And it still is. Aaron Mayer, thank you very, very much. We appreciate you coming on. We're going to take a... The first step of Project Blue Beam concerns the breakdown of all archaeological knowledge. This will apparently be accomplished by faking earthquakes at precise locations around the planet. At these new locations, Supposedly new discoveries will finally explain to all people the error of all fundamental religious doctrines. Specifically the Christian, and Muslim doctrines. The falsification of this information will be used to make all nations believe that their religious doctrines have been misunderstood for centuries, and misinterpreted. These new rediscovers will be used to discredit all fundamental religious doctrines. This is the first preparation for the plan for humanity because what they want to do is destroy the beliefs of all Christians and Muslims on the planet. To do that, they need some false proof from the far past that will prove to all nations that their religions have all been misinterpreted, and misunderstood. All right, that is great to have you along for breakfast this morning. Our next guest, Lloyd Pye, is the caretaker of what's referred to as the Star Child Skull, an unusually shaped skull found in Mexico. Uh, now, he's in the country in New Zealand this week raising money to research the skull's origins, which he believes could be alien. Lloyd Pye is with me. Uh, good morning to you. Thank you. And welcome to New Zealand. Um, good to be here. Uh, we've got a couple of skulls here, and we only have a few minutes, and you've spent how many years on this project? Uh, 11th year. In the 11th year. year. Wow. Um, we are only have a few minutes. Uh, these are model skulls. This right. is the skull of a uh, slightly smaller than usual normal, normal human being. Right. And this is an exact replica of the skull that was found in Mexico in what, 1930? Right, exactly. All right. Well, the differences are that the bone in this one is half as thick as it should be. If you, you're welcome to pick them up and feel. The difference in it, weight it, is striking. substantial. Exactly. Yeah. If you yeah. hold that yeah. one, you'll see. Yeah, that's very, very light. Right. And yet, it has been deemed to be twice as strong exactly. as average bone. Right. It's got some fibers woven through it, Paul, uh, that is like no other bone in the world. There's no other bone we know of that has these fibers woven through, and those add strength to it. Another thing it does is the bone itself is more like tooth enamel than bone. It's much harder than average bone due to its chemistry. So that's one of just many things that are very, very unusual about this skull. Um, as we were saying, it it's weighs half as much, the bone is half as thick, it's two, two or three times as hard. If you look around here at the rear, one of the most important differences is this area right here mm -hmm. is, is, as you can see and feel, is a dent. We all have a knot at the rear of our heads. Yes. Everybody has that. And uh, that's human, monkey, chimp, every animal that's got a head attached to a neck has this. 
This does not. This is missing that. Right. And there are also some interesting nasal um, formations there too, aren't there? Well, it has no sinuses, for yeah. example. It's got very, very shallow eye sockets. So if it, if it had eyes like human eyes, it would be very dangerous because it would be bulging off the right. face. Now, the one thing that, I mean, there are certain things we know as an absolute fact. We know as an absolute fact that this is bone. We know as an absolute, absolute fact, fact that it is a skull. Exactly. So those things we know. Now, now people lay people are going to look at that and they're going to say is it not just a deformity we've had experts of various kinds look at it in great detail and they can't come up with a deformity with, that would cause all these things to change about it it's chemistry put fibers in the bone give it such an increased brain capacity take away its sinuses when you add up all the things that are different about it there's no deformity known that makes it that way plus we have the fact of a DNA test that was run already that's established that its mother was human and its father was not. We don't know so what from, its father from was. from preliminary DNA that. tests, because obviously you want to raise some more money to, to right. do much more in-depth DNA right. tests, because exactly. you would like from that to construct an entire skeleton, effectively. But well, from the preliminary tests, you've determined that it is of or, or involves human Right. form, human right. origin. What we think, looking at the DNA test from 203, we're fairly convinced that it's a human-alien hybrid of some kind. What we need to establish by by getting the test for the, to recover the entire genome, we will be able to lay its full genome down against a human, against a chimp, against a gorilla, and soon against a Neanderthal, and we will know where it lays on that line. All right, it's, I mean, it's, it's fascinating, and I mean, it, 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 you'd have to be a fool to sit here and not be fascinated by it, and obviously right. it's, it's compelled you for many, many years. You are an ex-U.S. intelligence special agent. Right. Um, but when you say its, it's mother was human, its father was an alien, a huge number of people will think you are a kook. Right. Well, they have every right to think that. I, when I first saw it and they first gave it to me and I first started, I thought, sure, it was a deformity. I was confident it had to be a deformity. And every test we done, we've done many tests, all the tests you can do, really, up to this final genomic mm -hmm. DNA test, we've done everything we can do, and every test it's passed. You it's, will be can, speaking in New Zealand? I'm mm -hmm. speaking in New Zealand uh, on Sunday at the Mount Albert War Memorial. I'm, uh, if you, anybody interested in attending, contact uncensored.co.nz or co-nz, every day. Yep. Right. Uncensored Magazine, John Eisen, is, is, has brought me over to okay. speak at that. And we will, have, we will have details on our website, too, so people can go to our right. website. Um, Lloyd, thank you very much sure. for joining us. Thank Lloyd you, Paul. That Glad is extraordinarily that is light. Feel how light that is. Ooh. Ooh. So it's, it's half the weight, twice the, the strength. Pass me the other one, please. Yeah. Just sure. Ooh, didn't you believe me, Ali? No, I believed you. I just wanted, I like to get my hands me. on things for myself. Believe Thanks. Me. Um, um, that's extraordinary. Yeah. Oh, I'd like to, I'd really like it's to hear weird, the full it? story it's from weird. you on Sunday. Yeah. Thank you very much. Crusoe! Crusoe!
上初、熱心東京湾に現れるビッグイベントの瞬間でした。Thank you very much, a l e x o n Thank you. メスコに消えたと言われるあのネッシーがなぜか東京湾に出現お台場の海で暴れるこのネッシー実はこちらウォータースクリーンというもので特殊機器によって水を扇状に吹き上げスクリーンを作り出し立体的な動画を映し出す新技術なんですネッシーと少年の友情を描いた映画のイベントが行われ水のスクリーンに現れたネッシーは全長15メートルとなかなかの迫力でした。The second step of Project Blue Beam involves a gigantic space show with three-dimensional optical holograms, sounds, and laser projections of multiple holographic images to different parts of the world, each receiving a different image according to the predominating regional national religious faith. This new god will be speaking in all languages. At the end of this light show, the gods will all merge into one god, the Antichrist. These holographic images will be projected from space based laser generating satellites, beaming simultaneous images to the four corners of the planet. We see tests of these holographic images every once in a while.
Et je finis. Non. Il va être un Dieu. Il s'est levé de ce côté. Je me tiens à la scène. Alléluia. Amen. Sans toi The result of these deliberately staged events will be to show the world the new Christ, the new Messiah, Matria, for the immediate implementation of the new world religion. The voice of the new Messiah will be accomplished with the aid of a Soviet supercomputer. Fed with the minute physio-psychological particulars based on their studies of the anatomy and electromechanical composition of the human body, and the studies of the electrical chemical, and biological properties of the human brain. In the 1960s, Professor Jose Delgado took a normally hostile bull and implanted electrodes into its brain, electrodes that could be activated by a radio transmitter. His objective was to see if stimulation of the bull's midbrain could short-circuit the rage signals, stopping the bull before it reached the matador. After the bull had recovered from the implantation and in mid-charge, the button was pressed. The bull's aggression ceased and the bull's aggression ceased instantly. A clearer experiment was performed with cats. In this classic example, the hypothalamus, the rhythm maker, was implanted with electrodes. Could it be responsible not just for rhythms, but also for rage? The switch is turned. Then the switch is turned off. So indeed, the hypothalamus does control certain types of aggression. This is um, CIA director David Petraeus in a speech he made or a talk he talked about the uh, Internet of Things. This is what he said. Uh, Items of interest will be located, identified, monitored and remotely controlled through technologies such as radio frequency identification, microchips, sensor networks, tiny embedded servers, and energy harvesters, all connected to the next generation of internet uh, uh, using uh, abundant, low cost, and high power computing that would transform the art of spying and allow people to be monitored and automatically, uh, automatically without planting bugs or direct infiltration. He said that this involved new technologies which added processes and web connections to previously home appliances um, like fridges, ovens, lighting systems. Remember that for a second. This is known as the Internet of Things. Petraeus has confirmed that people would be watched through televisions. These are Orwell's tele uh, screens. So the idea of the smart meters is to create this, en this energetic environment, this information environment, which is delivering information about you to the authorities and delivering information from the authorities at the subconscious level to speak to you. The smart grid is watching you. And the idea then is to connect these grids in different countries into a global grid. They talk about it in their documents. These computers were fed, as well, with the languages of all human cultures, and their meanings. The dialects of all cultures have been fed into the computers from satellite transmissions. The Soviets began to feed the computers with objective programs like the ones of the new messiah. It also seems that the Soviets, the new world order people, have resorted to suicidal methods with the human society by allocating electronic wavelengths for every person, and every society and culture to induce suicidal thoughts if the person doesn't comply with the dictates of the New World Order. Deadly and dedicated. In this note from White's diaries, it says, Call Lovell, regarding TD. TD was a rather transparent cover for Truth Drug. George White worked with the Truth Drug Committee here at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in the nation's capital. They experimented with mescaline, scopolamine, and marijuana on unwitting victims. The committee soon learned there was no easy panacea, no truth drug at this stage. But White and later colleagues would not stop trying. The goal remained the same. 
As this 1952 CIA memo says, the aim is controlling an individual to the point where he will do our bidding against his will and even against such fundamental laws of nature as self-preservation. But it was a discovery here in Basel, Switzerland, at Sandoz Laboratories by Dr. Albert Hoffman that led the intelligence agencies of America to believe that they had found the panacea. The discovery was lysergic acid diethylamide, LSD. From a previously classified deposition of Dr. James Cattell, who administered the mescaline derivative, on the purpose of the drug testing, to produce symptoms similar to those that you see in schizophrenia. On how much the patient knew about all this. We didn't delineate all the possibilities of what might happen because then you contaminate your experiment. Cattell then relates that he never even knew what drug he had given Harold Blower because of the secrecy of the army experiments. We didn't know whether it was dog piss. This was secret, this was a secret. We weren't in on it. We asked Blower's daughter, Elizabeth, for her reaction. What? How can anybody react to that? I mean, and it's so far from, from what you'd expect from a human being, never mind a doctor, never mind a professional specialist who's supposed to care about people's minds. It's, it's unbelievable. A suit filed by Elizabeth Barrett against the Army Chemical Corps is now pending in federal court. Other Army experiments continued on mental patients around the country. Work done at the Tulane Medical Center in New Orleans involved several drugs, hallucinogenics, and electrodes implanted in the brain. The chief researcher was Dr. Russell Monroe, now head of the psychiatry department at the University of Maryland. These are various progress reports written by Dr. Monroe and recently obtained by ABC News. From one of the progress reports, a report of a woman who had electrodes implanted in the brain and was then given LSD and other drugs. She became agitated, cried, lapsed into a trance-like state. Felt as if she were about to have a convulsion. Experienced waves of darkness and light. had bizarre sensations in her neck and legs, said somebody was trying to manipulate her body. The third step of Project Blue Beam deals with telepathic electronic two-way communication, where ELF, extra low frequency, VLF, very low frequency, and LF, low frequency, Waves will reach each person from within his or her own mind, convincing each of them that their own God is speaking to them from the very depths of their own soul. Will you pull me the mainstream news article about the new light bulbs that uh, are going to have computer signals going through them, basically programming and interfacing with your computer, and the other patent number article uh, dealing with the admission that not only does the flicker rate on TV put you into a mesmerized, hypnotized, highly suggestible state, but that not only propaganda messages can be on what's being said on TV, that's one level of propaganda, and the flicker rate puts you in that, suge in that suggestible state, but that the that actual data, uh, that, that, that they can put signals in the flicker that can make you sick, make you angry, make you happy, this is mind control. You know, 100 years ago, how would a uh, hypnotist um, hypnotize you. You know, they do it by having you watch a flashing light or a watch. Well, this is 21st century versions of that. You know, watch the watch. Listen to me. Do what I say. You know, for those of you out there tuning in for the first time who are hearing this and laughing at what I'm saying, let me just give you a few examples of what I'm talking about, then I'll get into what's happening in North Africa and the Middle East and what's happening with the economy. Uh, here is, yeah, this is good, but there's, there's one other. There's the actual article on this patent. Uh, there's one more article I need, guys. Uh, the, yeah, thank you, uh, the actual article about the patent. Uh, but uh, here's the patent. 
It's patent 6-506-148, and it's at the U.S. Patent Office. Uh, current U.S. class, current international class, and it's got its coded uh, larger number there, U.S. patent document. Uh, this is uh, from January 14th, 2003, and this is just one of countless patent documents uh, that are out there dealing with this, and it's titled Nervous System Manipulation by Electromagnetic Fields from Monitors. Psychological effects have been observed in human subjects in response to stimulation of the skin with weak magnetic fields that are pulsed with a certain frequency near the 1.5 hertz to 2.4 hertz, such as to excite a sensory resonance. Many computer monitors and TV tubes, when displaying pulsed images, emit pulse electromagnetic fields of sufficient amplitudes to cause such excitation. It is therefore possible to manipulate the nervous system of a subject by pulsing images displayed on a nearby computer monitor or TV set for the latter. The image pulsing may be embedded in the program material. Did you hear that on the actual video that they're feeding into it? You know, the original signal. Or it may be overlaid by modulating a video stream, either with an RF signal or as a video signal. The image displayed on the computer monitor may be pulsed effectively by a simple computer program for certain monitors, pulsed le electromagnetic fields capable of exciting sensory resonances in nearby subjects may be generated even as the display images are pulsed with a subliminal intensity. That means you don't know about it or notice it. And uh, here's an article about it. Uh, patent nervous system manipulation from TV monitors. Now, we've had Dr. Nick Begich, whose brother is also a U.S. Senator, his father, a former congressman who was murdered. Uh, but uh, side issue, um, Dr. Nick Begich has, has always tried to explain to me, Alex, yes, they admit they want to put lithium in the water to calm us. And now that's mainstream news. Even Fox News reports how great it's going to be to have lithium in our water and how Japan's moving to do it and how sodium fluoride also brain damages you and calms you and makes you servile and lowers your IQ. But he said that's child's play compared to the thousands of patents, most of them U.S. government, dealing with electromagnetics through cell towers, through TV towers, uh, through uh, cell phones, where they can modulate and make you throw up, make you become giddy, make you uh, have an aphrodisiac, make you die, make you have a heart attack. And I remember close to 10 years ago, the Baltimore Sun, somebody ought to research it and pull it up, I forget the exact headline, but it was... DARPA looking at ways to calm the public during riots. They're not just looking at sound cannons or microwave guns. Now those are rolled out at the Tea Party, as you've seen. I was kooky to cover it 10 years ago. Now it's mainstream news and it's being used against us. But they said they're also getting ready to deploy towers that put off a magnetic resonance that will calm people during emergencies. Such rays from satellites are fed from the memories of computers that have stored massive data about every human on Earth and their languages. The rays will then interlace with their natural thinking to form what we call diffuse artificial thought. That kind of technology goes into the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s research where the human brain has been compared to a computer. Information is fed in, processed, integrated and then the response is formulated and acted upon. The fourth and final step of Operation Blue Beam, involves making humanity think an alien invasion is about to occur at every major city in the world. There's wow. What's going on on this planet, Wow. You know. Wow, a guy that talks to 16 million people a day, I'm lucky if I talk to 2 million. George Norrie, the icon, uh, second biggest radio show in the world, calling in. Uh, George, so much is happening. I'm glad you called because... Because the, all these military personnel said UFOs were going to show up yesterday and today. I made fun of it. And here's ABC News. FAA unable to identify object flying over New York City. Now look at it. It looks like something out of Star Wars or the Fifth Element. You're the expert on this. What in the world is going on? It is bizarre. That's going to be our first hour tonight, Alex, on Coast to Coast. Nobody knows what's going on. Police say it could have been a balloon. Now, balloons don't stay stationary up there unless they're tethered. There was no tether. Balloons here. don't have big lights on the front yeah, of them like on a Blade exactly. Runner. Exactly. And what about the 
reports of China shutting down airports. Something bizarre is going on here. Now, you know, I, I'm going to be one of the first to say, look, some of this could be governmental. There's no doubt about that. But I've always believed that this planet's been visited by ETs, and we might have even been seeded by them. But something's going on. If, if all this is real and they're coming back now, uh, it, it's strange. But you've got to remember, there's always been a talk about Project Bluebeam, and that is a false flag, a UFO invasion to get us all riled up so the New World Order can do what they want to do. You're aware of it, I'm aware of it, and I think we need to constantly watch that possibility. Uh, and people can find out all of this at DavidIke.com, but, but the, the final issues I want to cover with you, you were just on, wasn't it just last week, David? Yeah, last week, mate. And we were talking about Project Bluebeam, a right. staged fake alien invasion. And, folks, if you don't believe us, just search the term Project Bluebeam. Part of it's been declassified. It goes back to the 60s and 70s. And in the 90s, they declassified stuff. I even saw in popular mechanics about 3,000-foot holograms the Pentagon can project of the Easter Bunny, Jesus, Buddha, whatever they want. You know, David Icke, I mean, you know, they can project Superman up there. They can project Alex Jones. They can project, you know, George Bush, Kim Jong-il. They could do anything they wanted, and they admitted to unify the Earth against an outside alien threat. That's how they want to get their world government. Right. Well, to, to then see these, quote, military people come out and say, the aliens will arrive over major cities, including New York, on the 13th. And then we're going to show that ABC News article up on screen right now that I'm going to Zbigniew Brzezinski after that. Sorry, I flipped that on the guys. Uh, FAA unable to identify object flying uh, over New York City, and it looks like something out of uh, you know, Star Wars slash uh, the Fifth Element, uh, hovering with you know lights on it and everything. Well, we know they've got all sorts of hovercraft. We know the Germans had stuff that looked like flying saucers. That's where the original stories. We know they say the SR-71 Blackbird in service in '55, developed in '52. So they say the fastest plane in the world. You know, o over 50 years ago, total baloney. We know that they kept for 20 years secret the B-2 bomber. We know that DARPA had computers and Internet in the 60s. We know all that. Uh, and But to now have the Pentagon and the press club and all this promotion that, and all these TV shows and all this push uh, that aliens are about to land. David, I'm going to give you the floor for about five minutes on this, and I've got this big and Brzezinski clip and about how we're going to win. We'll get your take on that, and we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll let you get out to uh, you know some of the other interviews and uh, things you're doing there in New York City. Uh, but, I mean, here it is, because I, this morning I'm like, oh, the UFOs didn't come, and then boom, they arrive. There's reports all over the world. I mean, this is big. I mean, if aliens are showing up, folks, they're not going to have Air Force officers telling you they're about to arrive. And we need to look up the names of all these people and really do some deep research because we know there's a government program to stage this to unify people uh, and and also to cover up your research that there is off-world activity and, and that they're trying to create a hoax to control that situation. David, for about five, six minutes, you've got the floor. Then I've got one other uh, issue for you. David Icke of DavidIcke.com. Slowly over time. The New World Order has been trying to convince the masses through conditioning that aliens are real, and are visiting our planet. As part of the Iron Mountain Report, supposedly commissioned by the United States government in the early 1960s, a possible alien threat scenario was envisioned in this report as a means to uniting the masses together against an alien invasion. Slowly the masses have been exposed over time to the possibility of aliens inhabiting our universe. The movie Independence Day was the first to forward this notion along with Battle, Los Angeles and many others. Manufactured UFO sightings and spacecrafts have been seen for decades and have been increasing in numbers in recent years and months. We have astronauts and military departments from all across Europe and even here in the United States disclosing possible UFO sightings and encounters in a concerted effort to convince us that aliens are real. We even have the Pope and the Vatican's astronomy experts telling us and that more aliens secure are real. For you and your children. I couldn't help at one point in my discussions with privately with General Secretary Gorbachev, when you stop to think that we're all God's children wherever we may live in the world, I couldn't help but say to him, 
Just think how easy his task and mine might be in these meetings that we held if suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet uh, outside in the universe. We'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries and we would find out once and for all that we really are all human beings here on this earth together. But there are no aliens there. So then I, when the Roswell thing came up, I knew we'd get, you know, gazillions of letters. So I had all the Roswell papers reviewed, everything. If you saw that there were aliens there, would you tell us? Yeah. You would. I would. I would. Well, I think, look, what do we know? We know now we live in an ever-expanding universe. We know that there are billions of stars and planets literally out there, and the universe is getting bigger. We know from our fancy telescopes that just in the last two years, more than 20 planets have been identified outside our solar system that seem to be far enough away from their suns and dense enough that they might be able to support some form of life. So it makes it increasingly less likely that we're alone. Oh, you're trying to give me a hint that there are aliens. <laughs> no, I'm trying to tell you I don't know. Oh. But if we were visited someday, I wouldn't be surprised. I just hope that uh, it's not like Independence Day. Yeah, right. <laughs> Maybe that it's, a, you know, a, a conflict. Well, now we have friendly Maybe aliens. the only way to unite this incredibly divided world of ours. <laughs> They're out there. We better think of how all the differences among people on Earth would seem small if we felt threatened by a space invader. That's the whole theory of independence. You're right. You're Everybody right. Everybody gets together and makes nice and... You know, you and Bill O'Reilly would be hiding in a bunker together. Yeah. Oh, Bill O'Reilly, he'd be every mean thing he ever said about me. To say, I don't care. Look at that. American presidents. Key politicians and connected insiders have publicly wondered about mankind's fate if the planet was attacked by alien forces without provocation. Would such an attack, such as the one depicted in the science fiction classic movie, Independence Day, result in a one-world government? In this final phase of the plan, it will be made clear to the people that an alien invasion is imminent and the consolidation of government, religion, Military and economic institutions will be needed for mankind to survive this false attack is a way to push each major nation into using its nuclear capability to strike back. In this manner, it would put each of these nations in a state of full disarmament before the United Nations takes over. The U.S. presidential motorcade arrives at the United Nations passing the ever-present groups of demonstrators assembled on the other side of the road. A sense of anticipation in the General Assembly chamber and a warm reception for Barack Obama as he walks to the podium, his wife seated among the heads of state and dignitaries. The time has come for the world to move in a new direction. We must embrace a new era of engagement based on mutual interest and mutual respect, and our work must begin now. And the president outlined his vision of a new world order in which the U.S. would participate fully, one rooted on four basic principles. Non-proliferation and disarmament, the promotion of peace and security, the preservation of our planet, and a global economy that advances opportunity for all people. The U.N. Secretary General had opened proceedings sticking to his allotted time, calling for international unity. If ever there were a time to act in a spirit of renewed multilateralism, a moment to create a United Nations of genuine collective action, it is now. Now is our time, a time to put the United back into the United Nations. United in purpose, united in action. And a reminder that this UN building is due to be closed for renovation at the end of these proceedings. 
Our common ambition is to make this outward renovation the symbol of inward renewal. A renewal, importantly, in the which the United States says the, it is willing to both lead assembly. and be part of. Like Mike Hanna, Al Jazeera, at the United Nations in New York. Paradoxically, uh, this moment of crisis is also a one of great opportunity. And you know, I have been here quite often. <laughs> you mean to this table? At this table. And excessive optimism is mm -hmm. not uh, my distinguishing trait. No, it's not. But I So do. there is excessive optimism now? No, I don't think there's excessive optimism. Okay, well, you ch ch moderate optimism. I think that when the new administration assesses the position in which it finds itself, it will see a huge crisis and terrible problems. But it can see, I, I could see that it sees a glimmer in which it could construct an international system out of it. If, if you look back to the end of the Second World War, uh, many people now think that the period between 1945 and 1950 was in many ways the most creative period of, or one of the most creative periods of American foreign policy. But it started with chaos and fear of Russian invasion of Europe and governments that were uh, uh, very weak and people who were very... So the, the United Nations came out of that, the Marshall Plan came out of that. That's right, and NATO came, NATO came out, out of that. that and, and later the Clinton, I mean, the uh, Truman Doctrine came out of that later. Right. There is opportunity in the crisis because... Yes. Repeat it for me. Because? I think because when you look at the medium-term interests and the long-term interests of the key players, India, China, Russia, America, Europe, they really are importantly parallel. Uh, that we should not look at this current situation from a posture of being paralyzed by the symptoms of crisis. Fair enough. Within the crisis, there is opportunity. Uh, but when you talk about a, a new structure, new, I'm, I'm not sure you've used the term new world order, I mean, what is it? Is it simply a world order that's defined by new interest uh, and new mutuality of interest? Well, that's certainly how you have to start. Uh, and I know the view that uh, you start by converting the whole world to our political philosophy. I don't think that can be done in one or two terms of an administration. That's a historic process that has its own uh, that has its own rhythm. Has it set, suffered a setback? A because of Iraq and and B because of the economic crisis. And what suffered a setback? The idea of the America leading and building a whole new consensus for. A kind of... Look, there are so many problems in the world at this moment that can only be dealt with on a global basis. And that unique uh, proliferation. Uh, environmental energy, energy. Environmental. Environment. Uh, in some cases, global health. Right. So all of these issues necessitate a global approach. So you don't have to invent an international order. And so every country has to mitigate its pure national interest by the global necessities to some extent. Or, or define its natural interest or by, define the, its national by the interest, na global necessities. But it cannot push its own, uh, uh, its own technically selfish interests in talking to the leaders of the world that I have met and counted in recent months, uh, to what extent their willingness to cooperate with America has been enhanced by the very recent crisis. The economic crisis. The economic crisis and also the way the whole 
international system is is evolving uh, and i'm not saying that leaders will be able to be up to all the opportunities that i may as an outsider may may perceive uh, but i think they can start moving in that direction and i'm actually fairly hopeful that we will be moving in that direction it seems to me the larger point you're making is that the economic crisis that is prevalent in the united states in europe in russia and in china india offers an opportunity to make a case for something new rather than something old yes I, I, funnily enough even the jihadist crisis is teaching everybody uh, it's bringing home to everybody that it international affairs cannot be conducted entirely by drawing borders and then uh, defining international politics by who crosses what borders with organized military force this is now been reinforced by the fact that the financial crisis which totally unexpectedly has spread around the world uh, limits the resources that each country has for a uh, for a foreign policy geared to a assertion of its own pure interests so every country is obliged to set certain priorities so that foreign policy now becomes an exercise into seeing whether the inevitable priorities that each country has to set for itself can be meshed in some manner to reinforce each other can it be done i don't know that uh, it should be attempted and i think there's a good chance of it what would you call this age this opportunity this moment i uh i it's, it's a good question i haven't uh, you know, i haven't condensed it into uh, 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 uh maybe the age of compatible interests pretty good thank you good to see you again great pleasure to be here and requesting you back from russia many questions about russia we didn't get to the relative power of medvedev and putin and and all of that in terms of russia and its internal questions as well uh but this evening a look at how the world might be